We are in Daniel. I'm going to ask your permission and your blessing to pray with you, and then we're going to dive into this because whew, there's a lot to share today. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the way that you've blessed us. We thank you, Lord, for the way that you've protected us. We thank you for Scripture. We thank you for the ability to be able to study it and by your Spirit understand it. And we ask God that as we apply Daniel's chapter 3 and 4 to our lives, may there be stronger confidence in who you are, and not in us, but in you. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Last weekend, uh, my wife and my two lads, my boys, uh, decided to do the Continental Divide. Anybody ever done the Continental Divide? You've done the Continental Divide? Yeah, you guys are all crazy. All right, so... <laughs> They decided to do this. It's apparently it's like 30 miles of hiking out there in the wilderness uh, with a backpack and your sleeping bags and all this kind of stuff, and, uh, and just isolated out there. And I was not excited about that because I, I said to Becky, you know, maybe you need like a, a satellite phone. And I can rent one for you so that if you get lost out there, you know, you can call me and I can call someone to rescue you. You know, because there's no way I'm going out there to rescue you. But I, but I really felt, as a result of this, that I was probably the loser husband and loser father that you could ever imagine. Because I thought, man, I should be out there with them, right? I should be hiking with them, leading the family, saying we're going here, making sure they're safe. And of course, they've got like, you know, the, the bear sprays and the bear traps. And I'm thinking, another reason maybe why we shouldn't go out there. And, and yet, they were adamant that we were going to do this. And Becky was like, no, if I, if I feel like we can't complete the 30 plus miles, if, if I feel like we don't have enough water and we can't find water, I'll just walk back. Of course, she completes the whole thing. That night, though, uh, Saturday night, I, I was at the baby shower, which, by the way, if you've never been to one of our baby showers, you need to come along because they are phenomenal. Uh, what Sherry Eichmann pulls together with them, they're just one of the best social things that we do as a church, just to hang out and to catch up with life. So I was at the baby shower, and I was talking to Jan Gates, and, and she asked me where Becky was, and I said, I don't know, she's, she, she left the map on the kitchen, and she's somewhere out there on the Continental Divide, and I have no idea where she is, and, and I'm really worried that she's not going to make it, and I, and I shared my you know, regret in my own life that I was not able to actually have the courage or strength or stamina to walk out there for 400 years with them. And Jan said to me, oh, Becky will do it. You know, what are you worried about? Becky will do it. And it dawned on me at that moment that my lack of confidence in Becky was not about her, but my lack of confidence in myself. Do you understand the difference? My lack of confidence was not in the object it was in the subject, in myself. And I realized that maybe there's something going on inside here when it comes to confidence that we need to look at. So, obviously today, Daniel chapter 3 and 4, the first question inside the Recalibrate Inside Your Worship Guide here is this. What grows your confidence and what breaks it down? What grows your confidence and what breaks it down? For those of you who are thinking of going on a date, you know, you want to ask somebody out on a date, is it, let me ask you this. Is it, is it that... Uh, the thing that holds you back from maybe having the confidence to ask somebody out on a date is that you fear that maybe you're going to get rejected. You, you have no idea what the results are going to be, and the fear paralyzes you from even having the courage to ask somebody out on a date. Or, or maybe you're at work and you see there's a, a new job or a new promotion, and you just don't have the kind of ability to say, should I ask? Should I even apply for this job? Do I get the motivation to go and apply for this job? What's the fear that's holding you back? Is that you believe maybe that you're not capable? And so that holds you back inside there. Or maybe, you know, today is one of those lunch Sabbaths where we encourage people to connect together. And if you've not signed up, then you can see Pastor Jessica and sign up for that. And you're thinking, I need to ask somebody to come to my house and have lunch with me. Or we could go out and have lunch together and share that time. What holds you back from asking them? Is it that you fear that they maybe will say no? Or they will say yes, and then you regret that they said yes? because you didn't want to have lunch with these people in the first place. So there's these tensions that we have all the time that kind of chips away at our confidence. And I realize that most of our confidence issues comes from, not speculation, but from past experiences. And we think those past experiences are our reality. But in fact, our reality of what confidence comes together is not what has taken place, but in the subject. 
and I'm going to kind of explain this as we go forward. In, even when it comes to approaching God, there are some of us who struggle with the idea of talking to God. Should we, do we feel that we can approach Him? Do we feel that we're worthy to come before Him? And so I've got two texts I want you to look at, and uh, if you have your Bibles, you're welcome to pull that out, pull the pupa Bibles out as well. We looked at this text last week, a few verses before, Psalms 139. It's on page 581 in the Bibles in there, Psalms 139. And we looked at verses 11 and 12, and hopefully you underlined those in your Bible last week. Now you get to underline the next two verses, verses 13 and 14. For it says there, For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb, I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. Inside those verses there, the psalmist is saying, God, you know me better than anything I could ever imagine, and therefore, I know that I can reach out to you, and I can connect to you. And of course, there's the famous verse that Paul talks about in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. So turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, which is on pages 1104. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 page 1104. And Paul here articulates this, probably one of the epic passages, and if you haven't underlined this in your Bible, you really need to underline this, because this is what he says about us approaching Jesus, approaching God. He says this, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. He's saying there is nothing that you should fear to be able to approach God. In fact, the Bible's full of stories of everybody who has confidence in God and amazing, amazing things happen, taking place. Noah has confidence in God and the ark, and he enters into the ark. Moses arrives at the, shore, at the shore, and he has confidence in God, and he crosses across the sea there. Peter himself has confidence in God, hears the voice, takes the net, throws it on the other side. Jesus himself has confidence in God in the Garden of Gethsemane and says, Thy will be done, I'm with you on this. Which is really weird for us, right? Because we kind of like think to ourselves, hang on a second. Jesus is God, and he has to have confidence in God, so he has confidence in himself. And sometimes that can be perplexing, and we may even try to categorize Jesus as lower than God, but in truth, Trinity, equality, all together, what he's saying is, is that I'm gonna model for you how to live a life. And so he says, even I, Jesus says, I will have confidence in my Father, and the Father gives me the strength to be able to do this. Satan, of course, though, wants to destroy all our confidences. He wants to be able to break this all down. And there are several ways that he does this, but a few that I want to share with you is obviously the classic one that maybe we've experienced as well, is perfection. Perfection. He says, I want you to be so perfect and you place this perfection on top of yourself that your confidence starts to get chipped away. Because in truth, you cannot be perfect on yourself. You cannot just decide one day it's gonna be doing this. And you end up becoming a very critical spirit. Because if you're gonna be perfect, you have to judge everybody else as well. And you have to make sure that they're perfect as well. And you judge yourself as well. And so you're driving yourself into the ground and you're driving others into the ground with this critical spirit all the time chipping away at your soul. And Satan's the one who's pressing this on you, saying, come on, do this. Be so critical about everything going on. The other one is compromise. Uh, and we do this sometimes. We may drop some values or drop a cause. And we, in fact, there are some people who like to believe that things should always be decided on the majority. I, mean, I, I don't know if you're one of those people. We have to have a majority. When we have a majority, then we know it's the right decision. I am so glad that we don't decide things based on the majority. There are times when the majority gets together and they decide to crucify Jesus, all right? Majority is not the reason that we do something right. It's about the values underneath it. So it's not necessarily inside there. And we compromise our values all the time and we're trying to imagine what it actually should be like. Then there's also the guilt and the regret. And this is very different to repentance that God is calling you. But the guilt and regret, you feel so much guilt and regret, and so your confidence is chipped down and broken down even later. Our human nature is broken. This is basic 101, biblical understanding. The fall of man, fall of humanity, the fall of Adam and Eve, the sin that entered into us. As a result of this, our human nature is broken. And no matter how we try, we can't be perfect followers of God. 
all right? Just by our own strength, we cannot do this kind of stuff. Yet, we apply this all the, all the times to ourselves because we like to believe that we're big enough. But without God, what we have is guilt and regret. And with God, we have repentance and transformation. So without God, it's guilt and regret. With God, it is repentance and transformation. And the Bible story, the whole Bible story, is constantly trying to say, let me show you the character of God so you will embrace and understand what God is trying to say to you, that you are valuable because he makes you valuable and he builds this kind of strength inside you. And it continues all the way through where God says, without God, reality is kind of finite and terminal. And with God, Reality is infinite in the possibilities of what we could do. He says, come with me, be with me, and I will take you places you could never imagine. Life that you understand here, this short span of life that you live here, this is nothing compared to eternity with God. And I'm saying that God is pulling us all the way through this. And it, Satan still tries very hard through all sorts of systems inside here where he says, you don't need community. You can just be by yourself. And in truth, if you come to church and you sit in the pew and you worship with us, you listen to the Word of God, you sing songs, and you exit, and you don't stay for a Bible study class, or you don't actually invite people to your home or go to their home or connect in a life group, what you're doing is, is just starting the walk with God. You haven't actually immersed yourself in the, work, in the walk with God. You have to place yourself in the space to say, God, allow me to be immersed inside this. Allow me to be part of a community that holds me accountable. Some people say, well, all you have to do with God is just work hard. Work really hard. And that may be the dream for some people, but working hard is not enough. We have to recognize that we need God, and the more we need God, the better and stronger that we will be. So Jesus is constantly pulling and he's restoring. He pulls us through things and he restores us through things all the time. He wants to restore us to the place where we have creative power to be followers of him. He wants to pull us through whatever's difficult inside there. One of those ways that we're trying to encourage you is through our daily walk. And uh, that's online, and we print out the hard copies as well. But those daily walk exercises, those are supposed to create space in your life so that you can study the Word of God, reflect with God, and do that in community and discuss these questions that are wrestling through in your life every single day. So you come prepared to engage what's going on inside here. Daniel understood this. And I know that when we think of the book of Daniel, if you been a scholar for a long time, you study the prophetic books in the Bible, you may think that the prophetic books there are to show you some kind of prophecy always. But the prophecy is nothing without the context. The context is a story that helps you understand the prophecy because we believe there is application that takes place inside the story. There is always something that happens right now that will affect you later on as well. God doesn't just choose a vacuum and suddenly say, well, today I'm going to drop this prophecy on you and good luck, enjoy that. And sometimes we read these stories in Revelation and Daniel and we think that they've just been dropped out of space just for some random moment, but the context shapes them. Daniel's life struggle shapes them and all the stories are put inside there. So we must always ask ourselves, why now? Why now? Why did God choose this time? Why did he choose Daniel? Why is he encouraging Daniel to relay the story? Why did he choose Nebuchadnezzar to have this vision? Why is he choosing this period in the entire history? And what is he hoping to be able to pull through? Now, as you have studied the Daily Walk, for those of you who have gone through that process, maybe, and maybe you've done this as well, you have seen that there is a thread. And the thread between chapters 1 to 4, that there is something pulling you along. Often we'll read Daniel 1 and we'll get to Daniel 2 and get all excited about a statue and kind of like the, the second coming of Christ, which is all fantastic and truthful and wonderful. And then you get Daniel 3 and we're like the fiery furnace and we get Daniel 4 and we say, wow, he did it all. But in truth, the story all the way through from Daniel 1 to 4 is about one person, Nebuchadnezzar. And the prophecies 
are all tied into his life because of the influence that this one king had and the walk that he was having with God. So he starts off, the story in chapter 3 is not just necessarily about the fiery furnace because the friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they only have three verses dedicated to them in the entire chapter. The whole story is about Nebuchadnezzar, his reactions before and after inside there. Even chapter 4, the prayer that he gives afterwards is all about that. In chapter 1 of Daniel that we looked at a couple of weeks ago, Nebuchadnezzar says, you guys, you guys are pretty cool. You passed your test. I was inspired with you. Not bad. Daniel chapter 2. Daniel, my goodness, your God, not bad. He did some good stuff for you. I like you, Daniel, as well, but your God, he's pretty cool as well. Daniel chapter 3. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, your God it should be one of our many gods. It's amazing how good your God is to rescue you from this fire. Daniel chapter 4, your God is my God. And that is the story of Daniel 1 to 4. And all the prophecies tie into that and bring us back into those moves. Because what God is trying to do with Nebuchadnezzar is this. He's saying, I need you to move from no confidence in God, from all the confidence in yourself, to full confidence in God, and full confidence knowing your human limits. And this is very difficult because it's not a popular message. Nobody likes to go to church and listen to somebody say to them, by the way, you're not all that. <laughs> I, I know you think you're amazing. I know you think you walk on water, but you're not all that. And God is saying, in truth, he's saying, I think you think you're bigger than you are. I value you. I knitted you in your womb. I love you and I value you, but you are much more when you're with me than when you're without me. And you have so much more possibility with that. So he's constantly moving us from this finite, terminal life to an infinite life of possibilities and creative power. And that pull and that restoring is the journey of the entire Bible. Question number two then, inside our guide here is this. How does God move in your life? How does God move in your life? in your life. And this is where we're going to dive back into Daniel, and so I encourage you to turn with me to Daniel um, chapter 3, which I believe is page 824 in your Bibles, Daniel chapter 3. How does God move in your life? Understanding that that's what 3 and 4 are all about, trying to bring you to a space where you can see how God is moving in your life and moving with Daniel as well. It says there in Daniel chapter 3 verse 1, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits his breast six cubits, he set it upon the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Straight away, he understands all of this taking place. In Daniel 1 and Daniel 2, God set up the kingdom. But in Daniel 3, Nebuchadnezzar says, I set up the kingdom. You see the switch straight in and away? He's not saying, God, I need you. He's saying, I set up the kingdom. You said there was an image, and you said that it was going to be me, the head, and then some other empire. No, no, no. I am forever. I am infinite, and I will continue. And I set up this passage inside it, and I will tell you where it's going to do. And God is saying, I, I don't think you understand exactly what I mean by inside this. And I think you've ignored the future inside here. Now, just tuck this away. There is an image, there is 60 plus 6, and there is worship. See those three things? Image, 60 plus 6, and there is worship. And in January, when we get to Revelation 13, that will be an echo for you. You understand? You will like, I remember. He said, image, worship, 60 plus 6. And this is how the Bible works. It will start off, and if you go to Revelation, Revelation will echo back all the way to Daniel. Daniel says, hey, what? I'm going to echo back all the way to Genesis. And if you go to Genesis chapter 11, you'll see inside there, there are some who say that the Shinar, the plain in Shinar, is the same plain of Dura that Babylon, that people gather together. So when he gets to Genesis chapter 11, verse 1, it says there that all the earth gathered 
In Daniel right now, he says, everybody gathered here. You know, the list goes on and on. It's, it's uh, somebody's having a lot of humor inside the Bible when they're writing this kind of stuff, where they're like, every single person, the cat, the dog, everybody was there. All the officials of the provinces gathered together. He's saying, everybody to gather together. And this is intentional to show you that what happened in Genesis chapter 11, verse 1, is when they got together and said, we will worship someone else other than God, all of them, something took place. And right now, they gather together to worship something to get together. Then he tells us that the sound of music, when the sound of music, and not the movie, but when the sound of music took place, when, the, when they heard the hills were rolling and everything came in place, they would then all bow down. And the Bible records that they would bow down immediately, kind of like the clones. They would just have no thought. They would just like, they hear the notes, they're struck up, and they're like immediately bow down, and they will worship this image. And as they did this, they would learn that if they did not do this, because he articulates this very nicely, he says, whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the burning fiery furnace. This is what we would call turn or burn theology, right? You will either follow me or I will burn you. You will either obey me or I will burn you. And when a Christian denomination, a Christian tribe teaches you turn or burn theology, they, my friends, are Babylon. Do you understand? Because God never said, turn or burn. Nebuchadnezzar said, bow down or I'll burn you. That's the only way it is because he wants control over everything. He wants to not have you have any confidence in God. He wants to say, I want you to belong to something that has no tolerance inside there. I tell you this, what I love about Boulder Church is our level of tolerance with each other that's growing all the time. This is what we're supposed to be, a community that says we're not perfect, we're not hiding anything, we're not trying to live by the policy of don't ask, don't tell, we're living by the policy of actually I'm going to ask you and you're going to tell me, and it's going to be awkward, and no matter what, you will know that we love you because you love us, because none of us are perfect. All of us need each other. All of us understand and embrace each other. And this is a really difficult thing because the Bible is constantly talking about tolerance, constantly articulating this. When Pastor David talked about the wheats and the tares as well, I mean, this is the stuff that we, we touch on all the time. They are supposed to grow together. God is the one who works everything out. We're supposed to exist together. But sometimes I sit down with people and I feel like they want to separate the wheats and the tares out all the way through. They want to be able to decipher how everything's going to map out. And that's a difficult line to be drawing inside there because do you have the first stone that you want to cast yourself? You without sin? This is the tension that we live inside here and there's a tension of this church that I love that this church is bracing and moving forward and saying, I want to be a place that everybody's welcome at the table. And as long as we can find ways, creative ways, where we can all be welcome at the table, we are starting to live the community that God has called us to. God is saying, let me embrace you. Let me show you that I am the one who is perfect. Let me show you that I am the one who covers you up. Let me show you that I am the one who saves you. And let me live the love inside you to bring you together. You get down to verse 8 in chapter 3. It says, therefore that time, and this is classic, therefore that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. Now, these are the same Chaldeans that were saved by Daniel in Daniel chapter 2, all right? They are newly elected officers. In Nebuchadnezzar's father, he actually tried to establish this entire group of Chaldeans, and he pulled them together, and he made them in charge of the Babylonian Empire in certain places. And so they felt like they were the, the bosses. And along comes Daniel and his three friends, and his three friends, and they just push them aside, tell Nebuchadnezzar the dream, interpret it all, give glory to God, and suddenly Nebuchadnezzar says, you're amazing, come, let me promote you, kind of the same level as the Chaldeans right now, and be part of the inner circle. Sixteen years go by between chapter two and chapter three, all right? Sixteen years is a long time. These kids were like 16, 18 years old when they arrived in Babylon. Now they're in their 30s. 
They arrive in here, they, they've started to establish themselves in leadership, and the Chaldeans are not happy about this. And so they go through the classic process of 321. 321. This is how it happens, and I, I will give you my context, church, church here, so that you understand, and you can translate this at work, and you can translate this into your family, you can translate this into your own setting. People will come and say, number three, I would like to discuss the church's direction. Then they say, number two, I'd like to discuss the leaders. Then they say, number one, I'd like to discuss you. See that? Three, two, one. It was pretty good. It's very clever. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of like, that was, you just caught me. <laughs> I didn't see it coming. It, was, poof, it just appeared. So, it, you know, a group will come together and they will, and you've seen this in your family, a group will come together and then they'll say, let's talk about the family and level two and then, and then let's talk about you really. You're just the freaky uncle and we want to talk about you. That's what it gets down to, right? So three, two, one. And they did this, you know, that they said, hey, uh, ignore the king, right? It's not, they're just these people, they ignore the king, but level three, but you know, they worship others. Level two, level one, they're ignoring you. That's what the text says, right? And so they start off with, King, there's a group of Jews, just lots of Jews, all the Jews. Uh, level two, you know, there are certain Jews. And then he gets down to level one, there are three of them, right? Let's just talk about the three. And this is what he does, three, two, one, constantly attack him because what he wants to do is he wants to shape this comment but bring you to a place where this is what's going on. And I want you to understand that as I'm coming along, I'm going to surprise you. Suddenly you're like, oh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I didn't know it was them. Suddenly it was you. So when people come with their comments at times, uh, they don't understand that they're missing the context of where the journey is going. I have people sometimes who come to me and will say things like, um, I've got to say something to you, but I can't tell you who said this. And this is what happens with that comment. It arrives in here, and then it disappears. Because if I don't know context, I can't give value to the comment. Does that make sense? If there's no context to it, if I don't know whether they're, they're Chaldeans or whether they're Daniel who's coming with a comment, it changes and shapes the message. I don't know whether they are seriously a friend or seriously somebody who's got some issues. I don't understand. So context is incredibly important. And we wonder when we get to the story down here where they're going after these three, you're like, where is Daniel? Why isn't there four? Nobody really knows the answer to that. The best answer is probably the last sentence of chapter two. And you just scroll your eyes up to the last sentence of chapter two, it says there, but Daniel remained at the king's court. That's all we know. And so it could be that he pulled all the provinces together, all the leaders together, but he kept Daniel there. And you do understand that Daniel, no matter what happens to him, he's still on house arrest, right? The friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, no matter how they're promoted, they're still on house arrest. They just get to walk around freely, but they can't leave unless they have permission. That's why you never hear of them returning to Jerusalem. They just long for Jerusalem. They're just stuck there, and their lives are on the hands of this. So they come along, they meet the king, and the king says, I need you to bow down. And I ask you this, why not bow down? I mean, seriously, couldn't you bow down and just kind of like say, God, I'm worshiping you? I mean, nobody needs to know, right? It's just like, it's just a 90 degree angle, and, or maybe it was lying down. I mean, I mean, who would know? Couldn't we just compromise a little bit? Because remember, the influence you have, that's very powerful. You don't want to destroy that influence, so don't make a decision. Don't stand up right now. Just let it kind of flow by. Because, you know, in 10 years' time, Shadrach, Meshach, and Bendigo, you guys will have super authority. And with that authority, you'll be able to do all sorts of amazing things. So why don't you just bow down now, and God will understand. Let's go back in the Bible and look at stories of people who bowed down. Many did. Some even compromised. There's this famous story, the king who came to the king of Israel and said, I follow your God, I'm really excited. By the way, in advance, when I go home... I'm going to ask you permission because I'm going to go worship all the other idols, but I don't believe in them. I only believe in God. I'm just doing it because my people, well, they'll kill me. So you just, a little bit of compromise. 
So you look at these stories and you think to yourself, why not? Couldn't we just agree to do this? Let me give you uh, an example today. Um, say you have a friend. I know some of you have friends, all right? Say you have a friend. This friend loves the New England Patriots or the Seahawks, right? And they decide to come and visit you. They haven't seen you in a long time. And they said, hey, the New England Patriots are playing the Broncos downtown. And I want to go to this game. I've got front row seats. Miracle. I know, I know. I've got front row seats. And I bought you a New England Patriots shirt. And I just want you to wear it for the day. Because you're my friend. Because you love me. Because we're buddies. And then when, when Broncos get on, you just boo. And when the New England Patriots get on, you just think, yeah, yeah. I mean, seriously, they're your friend. You haven't seen them in 20 years. Wouldn't you be willing to give up your Bronco support? Why are you, this is your friend. <laughs> you haven't seen them in 20 years. It's a simple shirt. Get a life. Can't, can't you just wear that shirt and just say, you know, I like New England Patriots? <laughs> I mean, you can have like a false cheer. You can have like a little cracker, a little horn. I mean, they'll be on camera and they'll film you forever. You wearing a New England Patriots shirt. I mean, but it's okay because it's for your friend, right? It's interesting how we may draw a really serious line about our teams. But we struggle to draw a serious line when it comes to God. And when God says, I want you to worship me, and I want you to be faithful to me, we're like, well, a little bit. <laughs> I don't know if I can do the whole thing, God. I still like, you know, the other stuff. And he's saying, no, I want you to be on my side. I want you to embrace this. And this is the tension that we have, and that's why the crux of the story is not about the stone or the statue or the gold laid down on Daniel chapter 3. The story is about accepting values that shape your life and saying, I will not live under those values. I will not bow down to those values. I will not acquiesce to that team because I disagree with who they are. I stand on this ground, and I will make this a serious stand because this is a valuable place, even though I will lose my influence. Because I may. I may never end up with the 10 years over here. I may end up dying right here, but I will make this stand inside there. And they understood Babylon was all about wealth and power. And with the wealth and power, it oppressed people. People suffered. Evil, horrific things took place with the common people in the city. And they are now asked to bow down to this empire. So you have to have a certain level of confidence in the object, not the subject, and say, I, with the object, God, and with that. And that object is the assurance, that object is God. Well, his reaction to this in Daniel chapter 3 in verse 13, it says there that he had a furious rage. Nebuchadnezzar in furious rage commanded Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought to him. And then he challenges them. Look at the last sentence of verse 15. He says, who is this God who will deliver you out of my hands? Who is this God who will deliver you out of my hands? And the challenge is laying down because now they have to place their confidence, not in a rescue. That's not what they're placing the confidence. Hey, you know, I'm going to be fine with this. They have to place their confidence in God's will, which is not their will. Because their will would be the fire would be doused. And God would come and return, and the whole thing would be solved. They have to place their confidence in God's plan. And they do. In those three verses, they just say, we will follow God no matter where he takes us, no matter what the outcome. Whether our influence ends right now, we make this stand right here because we will not bow down to the idea, the civil idea, this idea, that you, with all of your corruption and all of your evil, are running society this way. We will not bow down and stand for that. And at that point, he says, verse 19, he says he's filled with fury, He's always angry, this guy, Nebuchadnezzar. He throws them through his guards into the fire. Then it comes the classic verses down there towards the end. In verse 25, it says, But I see, Nebuchadnezzar, 
in the fire. He looks in the fire. And this is a story we tell our children all the time and remember them in Uncle Arthur's bedtime stories and the color and the pictures and the furnaces and all this stuff. And we say, look, how many are inside the fire right now, boys and girls? And they're like, what? It's not three, it's four. And we say, who is that person? The son of the gods. That's how Nebuchadnezzar described him because he didn't know how to describe him. He said, this looks like some kind of supernatural being. He must be one of the son of one of the many gods out there. I have no idea. It's only when you read Daniel 10, 3 and 12 and Revelation 13, when you understand Michael in the story of this, when you understand who Michael is, that he's Jesus, that Jesus is the defender, that you suddenly put it all together. Surely, this must have been Jesus inside the fiery furnace, defending these people. And he says to them, who is this? And his reaction is pretty amazing because he's reactionary. He's always extreme at some times, but pulls back and extreme. And he says, I just don't understand what's going on inside here. I see four, and they seem to be all alive. And there are so many applications to this story, just these verses alone. Just for those of you who are living inside the fire right now, look at the story and say, who is with you inside the fire right now? For those of you who've just been relieved of the fire, who took you out of that fire? Jesus is your defender and he is the rescuer and he is with you no matter what the outcome may be on this finite terminal world. There is an infinite possibilities of where God is taking us. And as a result of this, verse 29, towards the end of the chapter here, it says this, and then he said, therefore I make a decree, because that's what he does, he can't ever decide anything without a decree, any people, nation or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Nebuchadnezzar has not agreed that this is his God, but he has agreed that this God that belongs to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is pretty impressive to him. Another 16 years will pass by for chapter 4. Daniel now is in his 40s, all right? He's in his 40s, another 16 years come by, and he comes before Nebuchadnezzar. He's called for a second dream, and Daniel, because he has tremendous confidence in God, knowing who God is, has established his relationship with God, doesn't even have to say, I will go pray to find the result for this. God tells him the results there and then. And as he's listening to the results, he tells him with absolute truth, with no fear of his life, with no fear of anything else, with confidence that God has delivered this message, you, Nebuchadnezzar, you are the tree. You, Nebuchadnezzar, will be cut down. You, Nebuchadnezzar, are the stump, and you will be like a crazy man for a period of time. And as he tells him this, he ends with verse 27. And I, I, I've got to read verse 27 because I think we forget these verses because this verse for me, you should highlight in the Bible, you should write the word conditional right next to it because it shapes this entire prophecy. It tells you something about the principle of prophecy as well, that sometimes we think that because something has been declared this way, this is exactly how it must be down to the little iota. But it's only after it's fulfilled that you know this. Remember last week? God shows us the stuff so that we may know that he's with us. So it says here in verse 27, Therefore, O king, let me be acceptable to you. Let this counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness, your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed, that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. Therefore, O bolder church, let me have this counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness, your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed, that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. This prophecy is conditional if he would acknowledge that God is the ruler. And if he acknowledges that God's the ruler, he would transform the world that he lived in. When we act like we're the rulers, we are not following God. When we think of oppressed, we think of people far, far away, maybe a homeless person or somebody in another continent. But there are people oppressed in this congregation because they struggle with the things that are going on in their life. We need to be the kind of community that says, you oppressed, we oppressed, we need each other. 
and together we will be followers of God. And he's calling us to this all the time. He says, there is tremendous power inside here where you can stop and you can repent of all the things that go on. So I have one final question for you. Question number three. Be one, bring one, will you? How dramatic does it have to be, my friends, for you to be able to say, I will follow Jesus? What has to happen in your life? Do you need a prophetic dream to take place in your life? Do you need, like Nebuchadnezzar had, 30, 40 years to process everything before you can say, I actually decided to be a follower of Jesus. I want to get baptized. I want to be a leader. I want to be involved. I want to be engaged. And I want to grow. What stops you from being a follower of Jesus? Are you waiting for a disaster to happen to someone you love or to yourself so that you can waken your senses up? Do you have to be like the Apostle Paul and get on the road and have the road to Damascus experience so that you can then have those classic testimonies? You've heard those guys that they get up and they're like, oh, one day I was this and I did this and this and this. And they spend four hours telling you all the sins that they've done. And then Jesus saved me. Hallelujah. I'm saved and I'm fine. 30 seconds. Let's pray. Amen. Done. Do you need all of that? Do you need to have a life of regret before you can accept Jesus Christ? Or can you just say, God, thank you for the honesty inside the Bible of all the pages of people who struggled, who've wrestled with you, and they, because of their example, made a decision, I want to do the same as well. I've got a video I want to show you, and I want you to think through this video. I want you to take your Connect cards out, and I want you to think about this as your Connect cards as well. What is it that God is calling you to? There are people in this congregation, in this community here, who I believe haven't made that decision to follow Jesus Christ. They know that God's real, but for some reason, something's holding them back. Maybe they are waiting for that moment where something disastrous takes place. I pray to dear God, you're not. For you to waken up to the senses of the beauty of the strength that happens when you follow Jesus, you live a life that has infinite possibilities inside there. A few months ago, I said that we need to be one and we need to bring one. Be one full stop and bring one full stop. But the problem is you can't bring one into a friendship space or a space that they can find Jesus if you yourself can't be one. You need to be one as well. You need to be a follower of Christ, absolutely. You need to be able to say, God, use me and talk to me in any which way that I can, but let me for once in my life allow the Spirit to lead inside my life. So I'm challenging you to be one and bring one, but to be one first. Be one full stop. Say, I want to follow Jesus Christ, and I need Jesus to transform my life. And to do that, if you don't know where to start, you can contact any of the pastors, you can fill in your Connect card, and we will be in contact with you. We will help you to be one. Because when you are one in Jesus, the world is changed, and is changed for the better. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for your spirit. Your spirit is nudging us all the time. 
I thank you for the echoes of Scripture all the way through New Testament, Old Testament, Lord, where you're constantly nudging us on this path. God, give us the courage to be brave, the confidence to be able to know that when we approach you, you are, you are there already. In fact, you drive the desire to approach you. Lord, may we embrace that and follow you 100% of our lives. When we fail, may we know that you're already there with us inside the fire. We ask this in Jesus' most beautiful and precious name. Amen.